Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So again, the preacher, he starts out and, you know, we talked a little bit about the first bit of that first verse. And now we come down to God spoke. God spoke. Theos leleo. God spoke. It's such a magnificent phrase that long ago he spoke. At the very beginning, at the time of creation, God spoke the world into existence and spoke over it saying, it is good. Then he creates us, the human beings, and says, even knowing what we're going to do, it is very good. He spoke humans into being and said, it is very good. God spoke. He spoke to Abraham to leave his homeland, everything he knew, and journey to a place that he didn't know where he was going. <laughs> and he did. He spoke to Moses to go to a place where he had fled for his life. He was on the most wanted list for who knows how many of those 40 years that he was gone. He had to go back to a place that had a lot of fear and anxiety in Moses' life. Right? Sometimes we think God won't make us go to somewhere that we're afraid of. <laughs> oh, good morning, Pat. He spoke through all the prophets. God spoke. But, then there's this but, there's this turn, there's this change, there's this, this move. Um, trying to remember, there's, there's a specific term in Greek for those letters and... Uh, um, man, I don't remember what it is now, but anyway, so it's, it's this move, this, but he's spoken before, but, and now the flow begins to change in this passage from the preacher. And he says, but now God speaks through his son. God the Father, God the Son are on equal terms. And he may have spoken the past in one way, but he is speaking now through the very being and the very life and the very personality of Jesus Christ. And this word, the word made flesh, was and is the definitive word. That's why we often say that there are no new prophecies, right? In a way, post. Now, that's a whole nother theology we won't get into. That like the Holy Spirit quit working in the days of the early church. I don't believe it because that would mean there's no miracles. There's no healings and I've seen them, right? God still moves. The Holy Spirit is still alive and well. But that God's word, the definitive word is found in in Jesus Christ. If he spoke it, we believe it. It is the chief word, the primary word, the perfect word. The mention of the Son in verse 2 leads this preacher on to kind of a, a rabbit trail, if you will, right? It's it, He moves into this lyrical praise. It, it, it sounds like he's quoting maybe a hymn of the day. You know, we don't really know. 
Um, it could have been a very well-known doxology or hymn. They had those. Um, there is something called the Didache. So we, we sometimes think that the creeds didn't come around until like the Apostles' Creed. But the, the Didache, 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 excuse me, Didache, uh, the, the, the Didache, uh, which you can even find on the Nazarene.org webpage under what we believe, uh, the Didache was the, the teachings of the apostles before the whole New Testament was kind of put together, and it has all of these doctrinal beliefs all put together for us, all the way from the early apostles' days proving the belief of the church even yet to this day. So they had hymns, they had doxologies, and so this preacher moves into what could have been a could have been something he wrote or it could have been a hymn that he was quoting. It was full of doxological statements about Jesus Christ. It's almost like if today I were to stand up in a pulpit and begin to sing all hail the power of Jesus' name. I think that would be all it would take. And people would begin to echo back, right? Let angels prostrate fall. It was full of doxological statements that would have evoked emotion within the church. That Jesus is. Jesus is heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. The phrase would evoke the Old Testament images, right? The, the Old Testament talked about how God's people are the heirs of the land, the promised land. It was all about getting to this promised land. They would be the heirs of that land. And then if they would obey him, they could keep the land. Well, they didn't obey him. They get kicked out, right? And just as much as God early on says, you are my people, he later on through the, the minor prophets said, no. Sorry, you are no longer my people. It was supposed to be, and you know, but you couldn't obey. And so now there will be a way for all people. We are the church now. We are the Israel now. The chosen people. We who believe are the chosen people. We are heirs with Christ of all things. But that word evoked those Old Testament images of, of God preparing heirs for the land and how some were promised rich inheritance. That strand was weaved together in this moment to represent Jesus Christ, who was the heir not just of a little tiny parcel of land, but he was the heir of all things. Not just the American nation, not just the nation of Israel. He is the heir of all lands. One day, those nations, for me as a church historian, and I look back and I see how the early church was centered in these places like Athens, Constantinople, which is now Istanbul, Alexandria and Egypt. These places that are now Muslim-run, Muslim-controlled countries and areas where Christianity is so much smaller than what it used to be. And what I see in this is that he is the heir of all those lands and one day will come again and there is hope for even those Muslim, strict Muslim nations that Jesus Christ will change them. In the bat of an eye, in a blink of an eye, right? He will take over his rightful heir of all. He is not just the heir, but also the creator. He is the first and the last of all things. He's the beginning of time and the end of it. Colossians 1.16, we read when we were going through that, that all things have been created through him and for him. The preacher goes on to say he is the reflection of God's glory, the exact imprint of God's very being. 
That's why Jesus could say, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. When we draw near to Jesus Christ, we are drawing near to the Father. Jesus is not just wise. He is wisdom itself. Jesus is not just good. He is goodness itself. Jesus is not just love. He is love itself. All personalities of God the Father are woven together in Jesus Christ. Think about that. Sometimes we look at the Old Testament, and especially as new believers, and we read these passages, uh, these passages all in line of, they went out and they killed everybody. <laughs> And we can read that and act like God is all mean and all justice. And yet, even in Jesus Christ, we see he called out sin when he needed to call out sin. And he loved at all times, right? That We see this balance of the personality of God all wrapped in and woven into Jesus Christ. He sustains things by his powerful word. Oh, let's go back. And he puts his imprint on us, right? He is the very imprint of God. And Jesus Christ, when we accept him, puts his imprint on us. An imprint that when we walk around this life, people see and want to know what it is. Do you walk around with the imprint shining? Are you branded for Christ in a most notable way, or are we hiding it? He sustains things by his powerful word and makes purification for sins, it says. That's referring to the death of Jesus Christ. That death on the cross that made atonement for all of us to where we can be at one. Atonement is just simply at one. It's a broken relationship made whole. At one with God the Father through Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit. In that moment on the cross, he renewed the brokenness of all creation. Wesleyan's as Wesleyans, we believe in the atonement of Christ for all. Now let's sidetrack for a second on that with the atonement of Christ for all, because if we're not careful, that goes into the wrong degree. So my chicken scratch, I want to show you this real briefly. So you kind of get the idea of the scale, and on one end you have a Calvinist scale, and on the, the Calvinist scale you have limited atonement, that Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, only died for some. He died for a small few, and he, he only died for the chosen, the elect. Well, we don't believe that. And if you're not careful, you go to the other end. You know, we believe in atonement for all. Well, universalists believe in atonement for all. And in atonement for all, that means that all will be saved. The outcome is, uh, how could a loving God really send somebody to hell? He wouldn't, right? And so, therefore, atonement for everybody. Jesus' death on the cross, doesn't matter whether you accept him or not, We'll all go to some form of heaven. We don't believe that. This is the tension of belief that in the Wesleyan holiness, the Wesleyan view, the, the, the Wesleyan Nazarene view here, and when I say Wesleyan, that's the whole holiness vein of Wesleyanisms, right? You know, and um, we believe in atonement for all who accept it who accept God's salvation, that a, a loving God allows us to choose free will. Some will accept and some will reject. 
we believe in the atonement of Christ for all. But not that all will go to heaven. Sometimes if we're not careful, we preach in a way as if we do think that salvation, holiness, sanctification does not matter. And we'll all make it to heaven one way or another. There must be a tension in our belief there on atonement. The last two phrases that he's seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. That refers not now to the death on the cross, but that refers to his resurrection and his exaltation. Christ is to be praised and exalted. And then he closes this section with that Christ is superior to the angels. Above all, that no angels are equal or better to Christ. We're going to talk more about that because in the next few verses, he defines this even more so in chapter in verse 5 all the way to the end of the chapter. So we're going to look at that more tomorrow. But even in our culture, if we're not careful, we... place deity on any spiritual being. The angel Moroni, if you've ever heard of that, who gave a new testament, a new word to a prophet, not that we would call prophet, by the name of Joseph Smith, who passed it on to Brigham Young, who passed it on when the Mormon church was founded on the words of a so-called angel that they placed in the word of God, forgetting the verse that if anyone comes to you, even an angel with a testament other than what has been preached to you, you must be careful. That's right, an imprint of Christ. May it be so in my life and my prayer. That's right. We want to be an imprint. When we realize the fact that we were bought with a price, and we put stock in the fact that we serve a risen Savior, we're going to talk about that a little bit to, um, on Sunday here. The beauty of this verse. I want to read just that verse 3 and 4 again because it's a doxology. A, a doxology is a statement of beliefs. People ask you about Jesus and you need to describe Jesus, you can quote this. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Christ matters. Our belief in Christ matters. Is he greater than all your sins? Is he greater than all your trials and your troubles? Is he greater than anything this world can sh throw at you? Is he the radiance who then gives you radiance? <laughs> Is he the imprint of God that imprints God on you? <laughs> Is he the glory that shines through you? 
Heavenly Father, may you use us. May we be your vessels. Shining for your glory. Shining to be a light into the darkness, into a world that needs hope. Heavenly Father, be with us this week, we pray. Use us as you see fit, and we'll give you all the praise and all the glory to the one who is the radiance of God. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, go in peace and uh, hope you have a great rest of the day.